in the 1980s, NASA began to investigate several options for sending an American civilian into space on board the space shuttle. NASA considered sending a journalist, an explorer, or an entertainer, but ultimately decided on sending a teacher. Among the applicants was a high school social studies teacher from New Hampshire, Krista McAuliffe. Krista discussed it with her husband, Steve, recalls Grace Corrigan, Krista's mother. He said, go for it, Krista. Sounds like it's tailor-made for you. In her application essay, she wrote, I cannot join the space program and restart my life as an astronaut, but this opportunity to connect my abilities as an educator with my interests in history and space is a unique opportunity to fulfill my early fantasies. I watched the space program being born, and I would like to participate. As a member of the crew, Krista's role was to teach several lessons from the space shuttle to America's classrooms. In addition to the lessons that she was to deliver from space, she was also supposed to assist in operating three student experiments that were carried aboard the shuttle. Dick Scobie, the shuttle commander, told a journalist, My perception is the real significance of it, and especially a teacher, is that it will get people in this country, especially the young people, expecting to fly in space. That's the best thing that can happen to our program. The Challenger 51L crew included Francis R. Dick Scobie, commander, Michael J. Smith, pilot, Ron McNair, mission specialist, Ellison Onizuka, Mission Specialist, Judy Resnick, Mission Specialist, Gregory Jarvis, Payload Specialist, and Krista McAuliffe, Teacher in Space. Commander Dick Scobie's first space mission was in 1984. He was the pilot and second in command. The mission saw the successful retrieval, onboard repair, and redeployment of the damaged Solar Maximum Satellite. Dick enlisted in the United States Air Force in 1957 and was awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross and the Air Medal for his service in Vietnam. A test pilot at Edwards Air Force Base, when the opportunity arose to apply for the Astronaut Corps, he signed up for it. He said, when you find something you really like to do and you're willing to risk the consequences of that, you really ought to go out and do it. Pilot Mike Smith graduated from the United States Naval Academy in 1967 and received his wings as a naval aviator in 1969. He served a tour of duty in Vietnam as a pilot in an attack squadron aboard the USS Kitty Hawk. Prior to being selected for the Challenger mission, Smith served with NASA as a commander in the Shuttle Avionics Division and a technical assistant to the Director Flight Operations Directorate. Mission Specialist Ron McNair was the second African American to venture into space. On his first mission, STS-11, in 1983, Ron was responsible for deploying one of two communication satellites. Ron played the saxophone in a swing band, and his saxophone accompanied him into orbit on his first space flight. Mission Specialist Ellison Onizuka was born in Hawaii. An Air Force Lieutenant Colonel, he received his Bachelor and Master of Science degrees in Aerospace Engineering. After attending the United States Air Force Test Pilot School, Ellison was transferred to Edwards Air Force Base in California and was selected as an astronaut in 1978. His first NASA mission, 51C, was the January 1985 Flight of Discovery the first shuttle mission flown exclusively for the Department of Defense. Mission Specialist Judy Resnick was selected as an astronaut candidate in January 1978, along with fellow Challenger crew members Ellison Onizuka, Dick Scobie, and Ron McNair. It was also the first astronaut cadre containing a woman. Her first mission was the maiden voyage of Discovery in 1984. Judy was the second American woman in space, she downplayed its significance, saying, I think the major significance of my being on this flight is not so much that I am the second woman, but that I am the 40th or 45th, or whatever the number is, American astronaut to go on the space shuttle in a period of a couple of years, and how far we've come in a few years. Payload Specialist Greg Jarvis was selected from over 600 engineering applicants from Hughes Aircraft, 
and was scheduled to conduct fluid dynamics experiments that would have tested the reactions of satellite propellants to various shuttle maneuvers and simulated spacecraft movements. Greg was a captain in the United States Air Force with a master's degree in electrical engineering from Northeastern University in Boston. He played the classical guitar. The Challenger shuttle's primary payload was the second of NASA's Tracking and Data Relay Satellites, TDRS. Working in concert with the first Tracking and Data Relay Satellite, deployed in 1983, the two satellites were expected to provide about 85% real-time coverage of each spacecraft orbit. Challenger pilot Mike Smith said, It will give us almost global coverage for shuttle missions of the future. That's going to be a big improvement, not only for the shuttle, but also for the space station when it gets up later on. The 51L mission also included 40 hours of Comet Halley observations. NASA had produced a low-cost spacecraft that could measure the ultraviolet spectrum of the comet. Mission specialist Ellison Onizuka was also going to use a camera with an image intensifier to photograph Comet Halley from the crew cabin. In a pre-flight interview, he told journalists, I will have about two minutes on four different orbits to photograph Halley's comet in both the visible and the ultraviolet spectrum. The 51L mission was originally set to launch at 3.43 p.m. Eastern Time on January 22, 1986. Over the next few days, the launch date would be rescheduled due to inclement weather, among other reasons. At 8.23 a.m. on January 28, the crew climbed aboard the spacecraft. The launch was delayed an additional three hours to assess ice buildups on the launch pad and to allow more time for temperatures to rise and ice to melt. The countdown clock began ticking at 11.29 a.m. at T-minus nine minutes to launch. At 11.30 a.m., the temperature was still only 38 degrees, 13 degrees below the coldest temperature at which a shuttle had previously been launched. The crew's family members were assembled on a roof at Cape Canaveral to watch the launch. Recalling the day, Cheryl McNair, wife of mission specialist Ron McNair, said, I still didn't believe they'd launch. It was just too cold. From her memoir, Silver Linings, June Scobie Rogers recalled the launch. We watched in silence as our loved ones climbed the sky sunward. Their craft from the distance seemed to sit atop a great flume of smoke. I imagined Dick in his ever-so-calm, matter-of-fact, take-charge mode. I imagined Krista in her excitement, nervously waiting for the solid rocket boosters to separate, the engines to cut off, and the buoyant lifts of weightlessness to signal their safe arrival into Earth orbit. Seventy-three seconds later, at an altitude of 48,000 feet, the right solid rocket booster, which was leaking flame from one of its joints, broke loose and slammed into the external tank, causing it to vaporize. Left on its own, the Challenger space shuttle spun out of control and broke apart. The tragic moments are recounted in silver linings. The unspeakable happened. Standing there together, watching with all the world, we saw the shuttle rip apart. The SRBs went screaming off on their own separate paths, and the orbiters with our loved ones exploded in the cold blue sky, and like our hearts, it shattered into a million pieces. President Ronald Reagan's annual State of the Union address had been scheduled for that evening. President Reagan took care to mention the children who were watching the live coverage of the shuttle's launch. I know it is hard to understand, but sometimes painful things like this happen. It's all part of the process of exploration and discovery. It's all part of taking a chance and expanding man's horizons. The future doesn't belong to the faint-hearted. It belongs to the brave. The Challenger crew was pulling us into the future, and we'll continue to follow them. After the tragedy, the family members resolved to create a living memorial to the Challenger crew, the world's first interactive space science education center where teachers and their students could use state-of-the-art technology and space life simulators to explore space themselves. It really seemed the only way to remember them. Cheryl McNair, widow of Challenger's mission specialist, Ronald McNair, said, It was good to be able to focus on something positive and know that something good could come from the tragedy. In tribute to the astronauts' courage and vision, Challenger Center for Space Science Education was founded and incorporated on April 24, 1986. To date, over 50 Challenger Learning Centers have been built throughout the United States and in Canada, the United Kingdom, and South Korea. Over 8 million children have flown a Challenger space mission since its inception. June Scobie Rogers once said, I know the mission continues when I visit the learning centers and see the children in action. I can see it in their faces. I can hear it in their voices. I can feel it when I hear comments from their teachers about the increased self-esteem of underprivileged children. When teachers participate in our workshops, when they get excited about lessons they'll be taking back to their classrooms, Krista's legacy continues. 
This is Rita Carl, Don Coates, Pauline J, and Patrick McQuillan from Challenger Center for Space Science Education, signing off.